All right, the time has finally arrived to create the inventory class. And it only took us five videos and several hours of prep to get to this point. I mean, in all seriousness, in all seriousness though, all that other stuff was useful in its own way and useful, um, useful game mechanics and game features in its own way. So, you know, it was necessary. I mean, we want to have a nice usable inventory uh so that stuff was was just as important so um let's see so the very first thing is obviously we don't even have the class so we need to create the class uh and it's going to be an actor component an actor component is a uh a, essentially a class that can be attached to an actor and it just gives you a nice encapsulated way to share functionality and so what I mean by that is um, we'll attach one to the player and that'll be, you know, where the player picks up everything and so on and so forth. But we could take that exact same component and attach it to a chest or something or an NPC. And we're going to design it in a way to where it's flexible like that, to where it can, um, you know, it's meant to be attached to anything like that, uh, especially like for chests it will let you easily like transfer items in between and stuff like that. And so I'm uh, gonna make a new, let's see. So it's a component. So I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna create a new C++ class. Uh, it's right here, it's in the main list actor component. And I'm just gonna call it inventory component. Now I wanna make it into a new folder and so that should be just components. And let's see, all right, so it's the headers going to the public version, the private one that'll be created. Everything looks good with the name. I'm gonna go ahead and create. All right, so it finished uh, doing its live coding process to add the new class. So we'll come back over to writer and here we go. Now, um, let's see what else did I have open here. We don't need the interaction widget for a little bit. And the HUD pickup, we'll keep the pickup open. The HUD can stay, it can go away for now. All right. So I'm going to pin these. Okay. So <clears throat> the inventory component uh, is, I'm not going to, it's not necessarily complicated in terms of the code itself, but it's complicated in all of the different checks that have to happen and all the different ways that items are going to be processed, especially because we're going to build in the ability to smartly handle stackable items. So if you have a stack of two and it's got a max stack size of four and you pick up three of the other one, it should automatically fill up one stack and then you'll have one left over. So I, uh, that stuff takes a little while and it's, you know, it was time consuming to develop because uh, it needed a lot of debugging. But uh, we'll, at the beginning, we're going to just do non-stackable because that one's pretty straightforward. So right off the bat, um, before I get into this, I want to show something that's, uh, that's really useful. Now, uh, when you create a new class and you get these, you know, you get these placeholder comments in it, after you've been using the engine for a while, you know, some people probably just leave them, but they kind of bother me because I don't like, I like to trim, you know, clean up my classes and trim out all the unnecessary lines. Uh, this is actually controlled by a template. And uh, so if you go to the path is, uh, here, I'll just show it. So if you go under program files, Epic Games, Unreal Engine, Engine, Content Editor, Templates, you can see in here that you have templates for every kind of, more, not every, but most of the basic classes that you'll create. And if you open up one of these and look at it, what you'll see is 
that this is where those default uh, comments come from. And so you can actually edit these and modify, you know, take that stuff out or put in extra stuff, put in, you know, if you want a header that's always, that you want to always be there, stuff like that, you can modify all of this. I would be really careful about modifying anything in the parentheses because that's going to, you know, pull from somewhere in the engine that knows like your class name and stuff like that. But for the other stuff, I mean, you know, you, the tick, you don't even have to have all of that. You can remove these like functions and sections and everything. Uh, I modified it a little bit on the actor class. You can see that I cleaned out all that stuff that I'm always um, complaining about, all those comments. So yeah, feel free to uh, experiment with that and modify those templates. So because this one's an actor component, you can see I didn't tweak this one. It still has everything in there. But that is, uh, if you've ever wondered why they are like that when you make a new one, that's where that comes from. So I will go ahead and delete that. Oh, and there is one other thing I just remembered. Uh, in the last video where I was experimenting with the pickup and um, we had gotten all that working, the uh, at the very end of the video I said, hey, it's not, the highlighting is not going away. When I would aim at it, it would highlight, but then when I look away, it would stay highlighted. It was just a really simple bug, but I wanted to make sure that I uh, mentioned that. So in the pickup class here, where we do begin focus and end focus, all it was is that uh, I had copy pasted this line down here and forgot to change this to a false. So it's as simple as changing, you know, it should probably, if it's still happening for you, it probably has true and true. So just change that second one and end focus to a false. So really nice, uh, quick bug fix there. Okay, so with the inventory, before we get into making any of the functions, we want to think about how the inventory is going to handle operations. So when you go to pick something up, it's going to come in as an item reference. It's going to come in with a quantity and a bunch of other information. And we're going to do some processing on it, uh, some math to check is, you know, is there sufficient uh, capacity, is there sufficient weight capacity, um, and stuff like that. And then we're going to pick up uh, the amount by modifying our current inventory or adding a new item. And then when we're done, we want to be able to take action based on what happened. We have to be able to, because we say we pick up, a, we go to a pickup class, we interact with it. Some of it gets picked up but not all of it. So the action we need to take is we need to get some info out of the inventory operation that says you're trying to pick up four, but only two were picked up. So then what do you do? You have to modify the amount in the pickup item reference to reflect that both quantity and weight. And it would allow for, you know, taking action in other ways too, if you wanted to do something else, I don't know what, but, um, it's all uh, when I'm when I'm talking about that. It's all right here, right? We left a placeholder comment here before, so we're going to call the actual. We're going to get the inventory, try to add it, and then based on the result of the operation, then we can adjust or destroy or do anything we want. So the way that we do that is using a struct, and it's going to a struct is always a really nice way to just encapsulate like data and pass it around as a single unit. So the struct that we're going to use, I called F item add result or just item add result. Uh, and so to start building that up first, we want uh, an enum that actually describes the add result. And so make a new enum. E item add result. It's going to be a size of U and eight. So item add result. No item added. Partial amount. Item added. And all item added. 
those are really the three main states, right? Because what else, what, you know, you either pick it all up or you don't, uh, or it, sorry, you, you either pick it all up or you pick up a, a piece of it and the piece of it could be none too. You could have no room in the inventory, right? And so we want to just be able to cover each one of those cases. Uh, I will add in the Umeta stuff. Go ahead and copy this. All right, and so now here's the actual struct itself though. So <clears throat> the item add result is just going to be used in the struct. So struct f item add result. We need generated body. And now we can start building it up. Okay, so the very first thing is we want a constructor. Because remember, a, a struct is just a class, but it's public by default, and um, but it can still have functions in it. And so we're going to make f item add result. I'm going to use an initializer list, and let me come back to this actually because I don't have the fields that are going to be initialized, so it makes more sense to add those here in a little bit. So the fields we want, we want a actual amount added. This is what's gonna come back and say, you tried to pick up five, but you only added two to the inventory. We want to use an instance of our item add result, and I'll call this one operation result. And we also can have a message. This can be useful for, say you wanted to, I'm using them primarily as log messages, but say you wanted to show a prompt or something on the user, in, uh, user interface that says, you know, inventory full. You could pass that back here and then handle that uh, elsewhere to display that info. So those are gonna be the three main uh, fields. So then coming back to the constructor, can do actual amount added. We'll just create a zero because remember this is you're going to create the struct and then you're going to fill out the struct in the inventory class. So this is just like what the defaults will be when you create a new one but haven't done anything with it yet. The default for the add result will be none. I'm gonna go ahead and indent this because it's gonna trail off to the right pretty far. And the very last one will be result message. And we're gonna just set it to the empty, empty uh, F text. Uh, when you have an initializer list, you need to add in, oops, I didn't mean to overwrite that. Uh, the function body, right? And so we don't need a function body for this. So there you go. And then uh, I want to add some new property information here on these three fields. Uh, here, I'll fill one out first. Okay, so again, um, this is back when I first created this. The first time I was um, making, you know, implementing this class, I had initially thought, well, maybe it's useful to put some blueprint uh, support. I'm gonna put it in here um, just in case. I mean, it, it, again, it's something that's super quick to change. It doesn't really affect anything. It can always be removed later, but uh, this is all I, all I did was blueprint, blueprint read only. Okay, and so because when you're debugging and when you're, say you wanna modify this uh, inventory component more in the future, it can get a little bit, 
confusing, especially if you take a break and come back and like come back, you know, say you whatever life happens and you need to set your game code aside for several months and you come back, it can be annoying and, and, and cumbersome to just get familiar again with your own code. And so that's why, you know, when I do stuff like making these variable names kind of long and, uh, trying to make things very explicit in terms of like function names and all that, it's all to help that to help your code always be understood even by yourself. The other thing is that's really what comments are great for, right? And so this happened to me, you know, I've worked on this off and on for years here and there, just tinkering. And I found that, you know, just putting some comments into this F item add result were really useful. So I'm gonna do that here. say uh, informational message that can be passed with the result okay <clears throat> so this isn't uh, quite as it's not quite as simple as what we have right here we're gonna add a little bit more we're gonna add some helper functions so the helper functions right if we wanted uh, we could create a new one of these and manually set these values every time. But we could also do some of the, automate some of this, right? Because in the case of, based on the enum, right? If you're going to get a no item added result, you already know what actual amount added is, zero. Um, if you know that all item added is the result, then same thing, you know that actual amount added is equal to the uh, the number that was tried that was passed in. So we can create some helper functions in here, and these helper functions can be static um, because basically they can be called static. Okay, so static is normally when you need to create. Um, let me think for a second. How to best phrase this? So normally you say you, you create a class and you need to use that class. You have to create an instance of it, right? So if we come up here and look at the character, this is a perfect example. So um, right here, so a camera boom, right? In order to use the camera, which is a spring arm component, we had to create the camera. So we call create default sub object because that's the engine's wrapper function that will put this object into memory and give us a reference to that memory so that we can act on it and call functions in it and everything like that. That is a non-static class because it must be created and loaded into memory before we can utilize it. When you come back and you look at a static function, a static function just means we do not need to create a brand new item add result to call this function. We can directly call this function and the way it would look like is basically it'd be f item add result function name, right? And then wherever we call that, it calls that function directly because it says, static says, this can be called without creating a new one of the class. Otherwise it'd have to be like this. It'd have to be f item add result, you know, pointer, new result, new result, function name, right? Instead of doing that, we can call the function directly. I mean, that's the power of using a, a, a static, static function. That's just one of the good things about it. So our helper functions are going to be static and they're going to return a type of this struct and so this function is going to be called added none. It's going to take in an F text and it will call it error text. 
<clears throat> now an error text with uh, well here let me make the other ones and then I'll talk about it okay so we're gonna go ahead, go ahead and copy this and then this one is called added partial and then I'm sure you can guess this one is added all okay so now if you think about it added none and added partial those should have an error text because added none you know you picked up you tried to pick up an item and you got nothing there has to be some problem either inventory's full or something else went wrong that could be worse like i don't know something's wrong with the something's wrong elsewhere in the code i don't know right off the top of my head what that would be same with added partial you wanted to pick up three and you only got one those are errors, right? But add it all, we don't need, you can call it message because at that point, it's basically everything worked. This is the ideal case, right? This is what we usually want to happen. The arguments, there's other arguments here that are that are needed as well on these. So we have our, our error text. This one's fine. So this one, you know, we know that this got zero. This one, we're going to, to add in another argument that is, partial amount added because basically this will say okay pass in and set the amount added by whatever you did get it'll make more sense here in a second when we write the bodies for these and same thing with the added all except instead of a partial this time it's going to be amount added okay so now let's go ahead and make the function bodies <clears throat> all right so see what this is what i was saying right is that normally we'd have to do this manually every time we'd have to make a new one then we'd have to set all the pieces rather than doing that every single place in our code where we're trying to add these items we have it here as part of the add result itself as a helper function so we create a new one And then we say actual amount added is zero. Um, our operation result is no item added. And then our, our result message is just equal to error text, right? Because they're the same type. Uh, it's a F text and then that's what we're going to take in. And so you can, I'm sure that you can begin to see why this is useful because now, you know, instead of, um, oh, and then yeah, since it returns an item add result, now we need to return added none result. So rather than needing to do all these steps manually every time, we know that we can automate this with a helper function. And we just basically, in the inventory where say we had this case where none got added, all we do is call item add, item add result added none and say why. And then all this these steps are already taken care of. So it's very convenient and nice and organized to handle the results in this manner. The other two functions are gonna be really similar except we're gonna to have to set some things a little bit differently. So you can go ahead and copy paste this. Um, it's going to be obviously added partial result and then added all result. Our actual, uh, oh yeah, fix this. So for both of these, our partial amount added is going to be, or our, our actual, you know, the amount we pass into the result is going to be what the actual amount added is set to. For this, rather than none, we're going to say partial, and then this one, all. Set error text, instead of error text, we have a message. And so this one's already done. Uh, and then this one is done too. So this one's good to go. <clears throat> and so, yeah, basically when we get into the functions inside the inventory where we're actually returning this. Uh, you know, I'll talk about it again, but this is just a really nice compact way to 
handle all of your results and keep everything bundled together. All right, so now we're finally ready to start adding in some of the inventory component functions themselves. <clears throat> so let me look here. All right, and so I'm gonna go and gather my Go find my banners that I like to use because in this case, you know, there's going to be a lot of functions in this, and so we want to definitely keep things organized. Okay. Uh, this is the default constructor, and this goes down here. All right. So functions. So an inventory needs a lot of searching functionality. It needs to be able to you know, when you go to add an amount of an item, you need to look and see, is there something that matches that type already in the inventory? Uh, you need to be able to find a, an item, verify that it's in the inventory when you want to drop it, uh, and so on and so forth. And so a lot of the functions that we're going to start with are going to be um, kind of like searching and finding items. So one of them, We're gonna have one called find matching item. And let me go ahead and do my four declarations. So in this case, I think actually only the U item base is needed. Um, let me add a little space there. Okay. So find, what find matching item is going to do is it's going to take in an actual a pointer and by pointer comparison, it's going to look and see is this same pointer or, you know, is this same item in memory uh, already found in the array? Uh, the next one is find, mat, find next item by ID. So if you remember in the U item base class, I have an ID and I talked about um, when we created this uh, overloaded operator, the inventory class is gonna, the inventory component's gonna use this. It's going to, because this operator is overloaded, it allows some of the functionality in the inventory array to check this. And so that is what is going to be used by find next item by ID. And again, these functions are const because they're not going to be modifying things. They're going to be searching, you know, calling array functions, searching for the matching uh, input, and then returning a reference, you know, a pointer to that. And so they can that that it's fine to make them const. The next one is find next partial stack. And as always, you know, I've said this multiple times, but again, rename these things if you want. You have, are not obligated to use my naming scheme. It's just how I like to do it. So now we're using our item add result. And this function is called handle add item. This is the main, this is gonna be the main function. This is, the, this is where everything that tries to add to the inventory is gonna call this. I don't know why I called all these. It's so so like I'm looking at my reference that has everything all expanded with I have comments and everything, and I notice oh, call these item in, but this one's input item. I don't. Maybe it's because I guess it kind of makes sense because right, this assumes a pre-existing item in the inventory or a pre-existing like item uh, pointer, whereas this one is like you're handling adding because it's something that's not assumed to be in the inventory already. I don't know. It's fine. Go ahead and rename it if you want to. <clears throat> so then now we have some removal functions. So remove single instance of item. Let 
we have remove amount of item and then it's going to have a second argument which is desired amount to remove so this one is different in that this one will remove the completely delete the entry from the array uh, so say you drop it and when you drop it you drop all of it so the quantity is going to be set to zero this will be called because it will now delete that from your inventory array this one is going to be used in say you drop a partial amount uh, you have a stack of four and you drop one that's where we're going to use this and then the last one is split existing stack item in and it has a second argument of amount to split oh and i realize i've been adding all these in the public section so actually Go ahead and move these. Uh, they don't need to be public. Uh, actually, do they need to be? I think maybe they do need to be public because, well, yeah, because like when you have a drop item in the player, uh, drop item is going to need to call, you know, remove amount. So that's my mistake. Okay, so those all need to stay public. Uh, now we have a couple of different uh, getters. So these are force inline because they're small functions that can be, you know, they can be uh, inlined because they're just doing one small simple operation. Um, we have get inventory total weight. And actually, let's leave it empty for right now because we haven't even made the variables but there's gonna be something that tracks the weight. I just started with functions for, for the time being. Get our weight capacity. Right, so this one would say, you know, what is the, so say you're carrying 20 pounds, this is gonna return that, but this is saying if you can carry 30 total, 30 maximum, that's what this is gonna return. We have get slots capacity. And so for my implementation, I used, you know, I used a weight, but I also used a slots um, because I was thinking, you know, if you have a, a backpack, um, it has a limited amount of volume. And so that's going to be represented by slots. Uh, and so that's why I have it split into weight and slots. Okay, and so now our, our inventory itself is just an array, as I mentioned multiple times. And so when we want to get a reference to that, we return it in the form of a TA array, a T array of U item bases. And so we'll fill, the, we'll fill all these out here in just a minute after we make the properties and variables. We also have a few setters. Um, we have set slots capacity these should be able to be forced in line as well it's going to take in an int32 new slots capacity and what it's going to end up doing is setting the uh, setting the the slot capacity and so um, why this would be useful is you know say you have an inventory upgrade you uh, I don't know, implement it in the form of a backpack or something and you know you upgrade your backpack. So now you can set the slots capacity uh, while the game is running rather than just having it as a default when you start. And same exact thing for set weight capacity. This is gonna be really important in case you level up and add more strength points to the character. Now, um, I'm kind of just writing all these so you have an idea of what is going to be what we're going to have to implement. Uh, we're going to have to go back and do all the new property stuff on this. So I'll probably um, fast forward a little bit and just uh, show it at the end, kind of review, do a quick recap on it rather than making you sit through 
uh, me filling out and copy pasting all the U property stuff. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and go back up and now do the. So there's actually there's no there's no public variables uh, that I have. Uh, the reason being because you know you don't really need to ever access your inventory weight directly from anywhere else. You can call get or you can call set, and so that's exactly what is uh you know good about using getters and setters is that they allow you to control the access of private variables. So now let's come down here to the protected. And so we here's where we're making the stuff I just talked about. So we have inventory total weight. We have our T array. And so now, okay, so this is something new uh, in Unreal Engine 5. They replaced a lot of internal pointers with a thing called a T object pointer. And so it is written like this, T object PTR. And then it is also a template. So you're gonna use multiple layers of your angle brackets here. And we're just gonna refer to U item base. Now this is an, a templated pointer, so you don't need to put your asterisk like you normally would. You leave it here. This is our actual inventory itself. So this is the array that everything is going to rely on and everything's going to operate on. Um, essentially, if you can go and read about the change and why they did that, just Google uh, UE5 T object pointer update and you'll find in one of their guides where they talk about why they do it. But it's essentially just to make things a little more efficient and type safe and uh, better controlled, I think, with like the garbage collection and all that. Uh, it's interesting, though, you'll find is that, you know, for something like this, you can't use it here because uh, these are going to be U properties and it'll tell you U property cannot return type T object pointer or something like that. I'll show you here in just a second. So works well to have the inventory itself set that way and managed internally that way but most other things are still going to have to refer to it as the normal you know i guess what i could call old style of the t array um, directly okay and so we want to add inventory slots capacity and then we will have inventory weight capacity <clears throat> for some of our protected functions and these are things that are that don't need to be uh, called from any external class at all we have uh, oops f item add result handle non stackable items it takes in a u item base and it takes in a requested add amount. We have handle stackable items, which is going to take in the exact same arguments. We then have, oops, int 32, calculate weight add amount. And again, same stuff. And then we have calculate number for full stack. So it takes in, oops, I hit the insert key. I have a, uh, on my keyboard, it's like one of those compacted mechanical keyboards and the insert key is right next to the arrow key, unfortunately, so I hit that a lot. All right, so calculate number for full stack takes in uh, an existing item. And then it takes in, I called it initial requested add amount because um, this, you know, very frequently this amount does not equal um, what you get out of it because you might be trying to add in four, but, you know, the next full stack only needs one. So that's why this is initial. Uh, and then I think that was it for that one. 
the very last function we want is add new item. And this is this is the one that actually so handle stackable non stackable handle add item up here. Where was it? Yeah, these are all responsible for doing the front end calculations to see if the inventory can accept the item. And then finally, once we're done with that, we call add new item and that will actually put a new entry into the array. All right, and so this now is every function that we're gonna be using, uh, every function that we need. We need to fill out, we need to fix these up here. Uh, and I think I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna move this up just to organize it a little bit better. We have our find functions, we have our removals, our split, and then we have our, uh, let's see. We got some getters and we got some setters. Okay. So now let's let's sort these uh, let's sort all these force end lines out. Okay, so now we have our variables, right? So for inventory total weight, it's simply going to return inventory total weight. Inventory total weight is just the float that tracks like what you know. I mentioned it, how much you're currently carrying. Return inventory weight capacity from get weight capacity. Return inventory slots capacity. And then get inventory contents is going to return the inventory contents itself, uh, which would be which will be a pointer. This one's going to be extremely important when we go into the UI because uh, when it, you know when we need to draw all of our items into the inventory panel, we're going to have to get the reference to the inventory itself first. <clears throat> uh, these pretty straightforward as well. Inventory slots capacity equals new slots capacity. And same for the weight. All right, and so at this point, ready to go ahead and make all the empty um, function bodies for these and get ready to start writing the code. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and fast forward for a little bit and fill out all the U property information on all this. And then I will do a quick recap when I'm done. All right, so it was significantly less painful than I thought uh, because, you know, again, I, th I think I've gone through and refined all this stuff at this point. Uh, used to, you know, as I mentioned, used to have some blueprint exposure, but um, since I've gone through and, you know, removed all of that, I, I think I went and, and took care of all this as well. So it's literally the same thing the whole way down. All the functions were set to U function, category inventory. Uh, the properties themselves just set to visible anywhere. Uh, same for the inventory array contents. Uh, just real quick, I'll show you the thing I was talking about with the uh, the error. At least in Writer, at least Writer will do this. So, right. So this is the actual type of our inventory array: T object pointer U item base. If we try to put this here, you'll see immediately it turns red, and the reason is. <clears throat> U functions cannot take a T object pointer as a parameter. So it's a little confusing to me because it's not a parameter, it's the return type. Uh, but it, you know, regardless, it's just something with, it's great for, um, you know, handling it on the back end. Uh, but it, it doesn't, you shouldn't use it with, um, with U function types. You know, I think about I think about it now. I think that I remember it saying that these are used to replace raw pointer, uh, like raw pointer accesses, which are like a pointer to a custom class that the engine doesn't necessarily know about. 
again, like I said, if you Google it, it'll it's like a couple little short paragraphs that they wrote in one of the uh, one of the updates uh, for when UE5 first came out. Uh, but it'll it'll give you more information that's uh, better than what I can give you off the top of my head. Okay, so now at this point, uh, oh, there's one last thing that we need. We need a function. Uh, we need a delegate. So a delegate. Uh, I believe, did we cover any yet? I don't think we did, because everything was through the interface. Oh, where's the interface? Yeah, no delegates yet. All right, so just to kind of give a brief rundown, a brief um, uh, summary of a, of a delegate. So you can think of a delegate as a, um, when some action occurs, the delegate will send a signal and there's a essentially a broadcaster and then there's a subscriber uh, for a delegate. Anytime the broadcaster sends out a broadcast with that delegate, any class that subscribes to it will then be notified and can take action. It's extremely useful for us with the inventory because that allows us to control updates of the UI specifically, but it could be used for other things in the future. But say we add an item, we call handle add item, it ends up getting added, the inventory array itself is now updated. What do you do to tell the UI, hey, redraw yourself and show these new items? They're you know, without a delegate, it would probably be annoying and painful to do that, but a delegate makes it extremely easy. <clears throat> the syntax for the delegate is pretty straightforward. I usually put them up here at the top of the of a header file, and it is declare multicast delegate. And now you give it the name. So it is F starts with an F, F on inventory updated. And so that's the name of our delegate. But now this is creating and saying, this name, this type of delegate will now be, be valid for use, but we still have to create an instance of that delegate. So if you come down here into our properties section, it needs to be public. It's called on, I'm just gonna call it on inventory updated. And so now when we get in here and start making these functions and we do stuff like, um, you know, we handle our, our we're going to start with non-stackable items. We handle it and say we get a add a result of everything at the same time that we return that add result back to like the pickup class. We also call the broadcast for this delegate. Uh, we'll be calling it like this on inventory updated dot broadcast. Obviously, it's not going to work in the header, but then we'll register to this delegate in the inventory panel and UI, and that way, when you pick something up, it automatically redraws. So now I'm going to go ahead and use Writer to quickly implement all the functions that I've written. Um, let's see. All right, so it's smart enough to not put in any of those setters and getters because they're force inline. Uh, just making sure I want everything in here. I think I do. All right. So yeah, you can see how it's going to be a good bit of coding that we got to do here. But, uh, I know I think it, I think it's going to be interesting watching it slowly come together and, um, be able to smartly, you know, handle all this, uh, all this inventory, all these inventory operations. So at this point now we're going to get to building out some of these functions, uh, like I mentioned. So uh, one thing I noticed though that I kind of uh, I went too fast when I was copying the U property stuff. If you think about it, we do want to be able to say we make a container or an NPC, we want to be able to set their uh, weight and slots capacity um, because right now with visible anywhere we can't do that. So we want to change this to edit defaults only, 
or I mean, really, you could set it to edit instance only. I guess. I'm trying to think, yeah, edit instance only makes a little bit more sense because that way you could have you know different. So you have three different sized containers right next to each other, but they're all the same container class. You just chose to use different meshes for them, and so you know you don't want to have the defaults for that govern all three. If like one of them is like a small little box and the other one's like a giant crate. So you'd want to be able to edit that uh, per instance. So change your slots capacity and your weight capacity to be edit instance only, um, just because that way you can quickly tweak that in the editor as needed. All right, so now coming back over to the CPP file, the first thing we want to do is we want to, uh, we want to fill out our find, our, our find functions and our calculate functions because these are the ones that are gonna be used to do all the other operations. And so I'm actually gonna take these and move them up. I'm going to take handle add item and move it down next to add new item. Uh, not for any real don't have any real justification for that other than I'm just this is how I'm mentally grouping stuff okay so find matching item is gonna be the the simplest one uh, I do a, a do a quick check just to make sure the pointer is still valid <clears throat> we assume it should be but again it's just a safety thing if inventory content, so we're going to leverage a lot of the TRA functions that are already existing for this. So if it contains item in, then we return item in. Otherwise, we return null pointer. So contains is just a really nice uh, quick, quick function here that you know checks if the array contains the element. Returns true if found, false if otherwise. So that's why we wrap this in an if. And so that one's already good to go. This one will, again, this is doing, this is the one that's going to do pointer comparison. It's going, since item in is a pointer, it's going to look and see, does this pointer match a pointer that's already in the array? And since the array is an array of pointers, this works really well. So for find next item by ID, what we're gonna do, we're going to do again, again, the safety check if item in, if essentially what you're, what you're, what I'm doing here is I'm make writing the type, writing the type of the array, you item base. inventory contents find by key item in return result so now what's going on here oops forgot one of my what's going on here is uh, it's a little bit this is still something that I, I struggle to properly understand but essentially, I, what this is, is um, you have your array and then you have a scope, uh, you know, an access operator that's going to get the type of element in the array. And it's going to make it a pointer uh, and we call that result. And then, <clears throat> so, so, so the type of element in the array is uitem base, right? So essentially this is, can be said as from the array, get the type, which is uitem base, and then make that the result and then find by key right and look at the description on this finds an item by key assuming element type overloads the double equals operator for the comparison our element type is uitem base and it does indeed overload this because we wrote it so we're looking at the element type uitem base we're using its overload to find by key the item in and then if that works that remember this is a pointer to the element type being you item base we then dereference that pointer and return the 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 result the reason why we're dereferencing is because this is really a double pointer which is 
if you didn't already know that in C++, you can have double layer and I think even triple and more layer pointers. Not that it's anything ever necessary. Double is the really the only one that I've ever encountered. Uh, but remember, this is a pointer and then we're getting a pointer to the element type. So element type would be this and then we need to dereference this to get the result, or sorry, pointer, double pointer. So we have to dereference what we get to get a normal pointer out. Again, I know it's a little bit confusing. It's, it's, not, it's not the most intuitive thing, but uh, it is very, it's, it's a really nice built-in function here. Find by key is a built-in TRA. It's just unfortunately what the kind, you know, what, what it needs. I believe this is because it needs to be uh, agnostic to its type, right? It needs to be able to work on any kind of array. And so I'm pretty sure that's the, you know, if you were to research this more, I'm pretty sure that's the justification. But, uh, you know, I've tested this um, pretty extensively and, and it works really well. So then, uh, you know, if we don't find anything, we're going to return null pointer again. So now we're actually going to use this same kind of syntax here for find next partial stack. But now find next partial stack is where things really get interesting. <clears throat> find next partial stack we assume is operating on it's looking at what's already in the inventory. We don't really need the safety check. To be honest with you, these safety checks really are a little bit extraneous. Um, so this one though, especially, it's uh, it's basically saying, look at what's already in the inventory. If there is a partial stack, return the reference to that partial stack, otherwise return nothing. So you don't really need to do a safety check here. But now the way that we're going to find this, we're gonna use a C++ a mechanic called a lambda. So let me type it out and then I will I will explain what's going on here. So first we're using this same syntax from up here where we get pointers a pointer to the element type. I'm gonna call it result again. So we're using the built-in function find by predicate. Now don't worry about this syntax right now. I'm going to explain this. Okay. So I know you're probably sitting there thinking, what in the world is going on? So let me break this down. Okay, again, we want a generic way to access the type of the array. In this case, U item base, but we're getting a pointer to that type. So we have a double pointer. We're calling find by predicate. Now find by predicate, if you look at the parameters, it takes in a predicate. Predicate is just a fancy word that means uh, a condition, right? It's something that checks a condition. Uh, in this case, it is essentially our, our predicate is really just an if uh, uh, a logical check to say if inventory item if the this inventory item ID equals the input item ID and it's not a full stack, then you return a reference to that. So the that is our predicate, right? But it says it's a functor to apply to each element. This is where the lambda comes in. In C++, a lambda, you can think of a lambda as like a one-off function, like a temporary function that you don't have to put into a class. You don't have to call it the same way you call other ones. It's just essentially like a, a in other kinds of uh, programming, like um, I think in MATLAB, if you've ever heard of that, they're called anonymous functions. That's another phrase you might hear. But think of it as a temporary function that is generated right here on the spot that does some, some kind of action and we're taking the result of that and using that as the predicate, okay? So in this case, what we're doing, now the, the syntax of the lambda is, let me come down here to have a little more, more space. The way a lambda works is you have this, then you have your input, 
So in our case, it was a taking in inventory item. Okay. Then you have your function body, right? Now, <clears throat> the bracket, the square brackets in the front are what's called the capture clause. This allows the Lambda, right, to, because functions have scope, right? Functions have scope to where variables inside can be used, but then when the function leaves, a local variable is destroyed, but anything that you pass into it, you know, will still be there. So what we've done here is we've captured We've allowed the Lambda to see the input array uh, argument to this function, which is item in. So we're now telling the Lambda, get item in by reference, okay? And then you can use it down here in your checks. Now this part is what's really interesting. And this part you, is not intuitive unless you pay attention to the function description. It says, functor to apply to each element. So what's going on here is somewhere under the hood in this function, it's iterating through the entire array contents. It is then taking each element in the array and passing it into this Lambda and calling it inventory item. It's then our Lambda is then taking our input item and that's where you have both the pieces you need to do these comparisons. So just think of it as every element in the array is going to be separately checked here as an inventory item. And we're going to compare it with our input item. And that's how this works. And it's very, you know, for it's efficient and it's relatively compact. We don't have to write a brute force like for loop. This is doing a for loop somewhere inside. If we go look at it, it's probably, you know, somewhere down here in the engine code, probably doing that. Yeah, see, it's doing a for loop <clears throat> with their, you know, weird syntax here. But see, it's calling something invoke the predicate on the data. And then if it finds, you know, if that returns true, return the data. So, I mean, it's doing a for loop already. And so that's why I figured I'm just going to go ahead and use this for one. This was a good learning experience for me and hopefully it will be for you too. But I wanted to leverage functions that the arrays already had in order to accomplish what I needed to do. Okay. So, uh, again, back to this though, back to the Lambda, <clears throat> the capture clause allows for things outside the Lambda to be used inside of it. And you can see that very clearly if watch, if I delete this, now it says item in is not captured, right? Because now this is saying, you know, your Lambda does not get to see any variables outside of itself. We definitely don't want that. We want it to be able to use this item in for its operations. So we need to put item in in the capture. The capture can have multiple things and it can take in things by like pointers and references and non-references and you know, it just makes more sense for it to be a reference here. So that's why it's like that. But that is essentially the quick version of C++ lambdas and why we are using one here, right? Because we're essentially passing in a function into find by predicate. This then uses that function to do these checks and whatever is successful comes out as our result. So again, be careful with your be careful with your sin, um, your formatting here. The it, this whole thing is wrapped in parentheses, as you can see, and then find by predicate the whole lambda is wrapped by those parentheses, and that's why there's two down here. You can see them highlighting. So the full if statement, this other parentheses goes with find by predicate. This these brackets here are for the Lambda. And then again, you know, the, the, after the if statement finishes, we, uh, if this was valid, if result was valid, then we return what it's pointing at. Otherwise return null pointer. So, you know, feel free to uh, leave a comment if you want to know more about that. But, uh, hopefully I, I under, I, uh, sorry, hopefully I explained that well enough to where it at least, um, makes a little bit of sense. 
All right, so for our calculate functions, <clears throat> so for calculate weight add amount, um, this one's pretty simple in terms of like the lines of code, but it's also, you know, I, I think it's good to leave some comments on this one just in case you need to do some debug later. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna return an integer and I called it weight max add amount and that is gonna be equal to floor to int of get weight capacity minus our total weight those parentheses were to to you know order operations make sure this happens together divided by our item in oh you know I realized I forgot to name that so hold on go back to the header here yep yeah, okay I forgot to do that on two of them three of them uh, you don't have to give argument names for C++ functions as you can see but um, it definitely I don't know really what the how you would even use it if you don't have a a, a name there so uh, you may have caught that earlier when I was first writing this so just go back and fill those in okay so back to what we were doing item in get item single weight okay so just to let's make sure this makes sense we're going to get our weight capacity minus our total so if we have 50 and we uh 50 weight capacity we're carrying 20 this will be 30. we divide that by our new incoming item weight so say it's five we should get a six here okay we then say if our weight max add amount is greater than or equal to our requested add amount we return the requested add amount right because basically if it was say this what I just talked about if this was six <clears throat> but we only were trying to add three then obviously you can fully add three otherwise we return the weight max add amount because this could be zero too, right? This could be something less than what you're trying to add if your inventory is pretty full. The floor to int here, um, what this does is because our uh, <clears throat> because our weight capacity and our total weight are floats, uh, and then this one, this is also a float. We don't need partials, right? We don't need to say, oh, you can hold, you know, four point seven of these. So what we're gonna do is we're going to round down, take the floor, floor being um, it will always round down to the nearest integer, and we're gonna take that as the add amount. So that's why we're using floor to int for this whole operation. Okay, so that one's good to go for now. Uh, now let's look at calculate number for full stack. So we have an integer that is add amount to make full stack. You know, and remember, you know, sure, some people might make this like some little short little variable name, but, you know, variable names are free. You can make a variable name as long as you want. If it does, you know, other than, you know, wasting a few spaces, like the benefits of naming it something clear are always greater than trying to make it, you know, like, <clears throat> yeah, you want to make, so sure, we can leave it like that, but this is just me, you know, talking about some of my philosophy. I feel like the gains from making all your functions and variable names very clear far outweigh making things short and, you know, compact. So anyway, back on topic. So we have uh, we're at amount to make full stack. So we're going to get our stackable. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'm looking at something else in my reference here. Where is this? Oh, OK, I see what I did. So I named this uh, stackable item rather than existing item. And I think that does make a lot more sense. So I'm gonna go back to the header file and change that. 
Now, one thing, you, one thing you'll notice, I believe it shouldn't cause any issues to have different names here, right? See, it doesn't, it's just telling me, hey, you don't have a return statement yet, but there's no, there shouldn't be any compiler error. There shouldn't be any problem with having a different name for an argument. Uh, the reason being because C++ really only kind of cares about the type. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, for you as the programmer, obviously you want to have these consistent because that way it's not so confusing. And again, even if you leave it like this, I don't know how do you, I, I've actually, I need to research this because I actually don't know what you would even do to use this argument here because it doesn't even need to have a name. Okay, so again, back on topic. So we are gonna take our stackable item, get its data, get its max stack size. We're going to subtract from that its current quantity. <clears throat> and so now, you know, obviously if it's a max stack size of five, uh, but we currently have three, then max, uh, the amount to make a full stack is gonna be a two. We then will return the min of initial requested add amount or add amount to make full stack. Why'd you do that to me, writer? So again, min is a function that's going to take two values and return the lesser of the two. So that is those two functions. We've got our find functions, all three of them ready to go. We can go ahead and do the removal functions next. So remove single instance of item is pretty easy and straightforward. We're going to take our inventory contents and do remove single. And that's going to be item in. And then uh, we call the delegate. So like I said, as I was talking about it earlier, you call it's on inventory update is the name of it. And then you just call broadcast. When you subscribe to it in other classes, you know, once this is called, they will immediately get notified. And we basically take the delegate in the other class and bind a function to it. So what you're really doing is when you call this broadcast, you execute functions in other classes. Uh, one thing I noticed that I did uh, just to make this a little bit nicer in terms of formatting and clarity, I changed the name of this to item to remove. So I'm going to fix that. <clears throat> All right. So now next is remove amount of item. Uh, and so what we'll start with is another integer called this one, actual amount to remove. We want to use min again. It's not F min, F math min. And we're going to take the lesser of our desired amount to remove or our input item quantity. This is just kind of like a safety check. Um, just because, you know, say you something, say some situation, um, occurred, which I don't really know how it shouldn't, but where you only have three of said item and this gets passed in as like a 10, trying to subtract that is going to mess a whole bunch of stuff up. Right? So we do safety checks on all this to make sure that we're never removing a number that's going to mess up the internals of our inventory. So that's why we're just doing another safety check here to make sure we always have the lesser. Once we have that, we call set quantity and we say item in quantity minus actual amount to remove. We then want to adjust our weight, right? If we removed an amount, we want to, we want to, uh, we, we definitely always have to account for that in the weight. So then it will be actual, oh geez, typo and stuff, actual amount to remove times item in get item single weight.
we then update our via our delegate and we return how much we actually removed. Now, one thing that we can do now, because we actually have the inventory component class created, we could go in here to set quantity. And you may remember earlier, I uh, said that this was a placeholder because we didn't have the inventory. So now it's time to go ahead and uncomment this <clears throat> and add in the owning inventory field into the item base class uh, because, you know, that way each item base, each item will know what inventory it belongs to. And then if you set quantity and you try to set it to, even if you set it to something crazy, like, and the math goes wrong and sets it to like negative 10, this should automatically see it and just go ahead and remove it. So it's a, it's another, you know, safety feature. Let me just find, so yeah, so here it is. So I left it uh, commented out in the header. Now this is going to need a forward declare. So just class inventory component. Owning inventory is something that's going to be set when we, uh, we don't have it yet, but here in the inventory code, when we go to add new item, this is the one that's finally going to add everything to the array when we get there. And when we set some stuff and add it, one of the things we're going to set here is owning inventory. So back into the CPP, now this, you know, should be good to go. This is red because it's like, hey, I don't understand what the contents of an inventory component are. So go ahead here and include components, inventory component.h. Uh, I guess I changed the name. This is, I think I just, had it renamed, uh, had it named to something else prior to, uh, you know, when I was initially uh, looking at my reference and all. So this is actually corresponds to our function over here called remove single instance of item. So go back into your item base and replace that. And now, you know, it's taking in the this pointer because it's saying, you know, this instance of our item uh, is, you know, will watch its own inventory and if or watch its own quantity, sorry. And if quantity drops to zero or less, remove itself from the owning inventory. Now on to split existing stack. So for split existing stack, what we're gonna do is we're going to do a check here and say, uh, we're gonna, it's gonna be something that, you know, we wanna negate it. So we're gonna say if inventory contents dot num and all that's going to do is return to you how many elements are in your array plus one is greater than our slots capacity, right? So this is basically saying if you can, if there's if adding one more thing would overflow your inventory, we want this to be false. We want this part here to be false so that it gets flipped, and now this is a true, so the if statement gets entered. So if one more thing will not overflow your inventory, we remove an amount of our current, uh, our current item, which would be amount to split. And then we add new item of that, a copy of that essentially, and we add amount to split, right? Because think about it, <clears throat> we have a stack of three potions we want to split that into a stack of two and one. So this would be a one. This would be the potion reference itself. All you're doing at that point is removing some and then adding a copy uh, that with the new amount, right? So that's how it works under the hood with a split. This will be, we'll use the split much later on. Uh, we need to do a lot of inventory uh, UI work first to be able to use that, but at least the, the code is here. And now we're finally down to the core and this is where things, this is the real, like the core of it is these four functions right here. Add new item. We're going to hand, we're going to, we're going to fill it out last, uh, handle add item is where we're going to start. And then we're going to do handle non stackable. And once we verify, then at that point we should be able to start testing it. And I'm going to save handle stackable from, for later 
because this is the one that gets really complicated in terms of lots of checks, lots of math. It does some iterations through the inventory to look at each individual thing to see if you know there's stacks that can be added to and so on and so forth. So we're going to, we're going to go ahead and get started with our uh, handle add item, and then we'll go in that order that I just that I just mentioned. <laughs> 